Good evening, church family. Welcome to our midweek Bible study. Hope everyone's having a great week, enjoying the nice summer weather. Aren't you glad summer is finally here? Daylight until like 9.30 or later, but it's already starting to get less now that we're past the summer solstice, but I'm going to enjoy it. Hope you are too. Well, uh, before we get started uh, tonight, I want to share a quick prayer, uh, missionary prayer letter with you and give you some things to praise, uh, praise, pray about, praise the Lord about. Uh, recently, I've shared some of our long-standing missionaries, ones we've supported for decades. Tonight, I want to share an update of some of our newest missionaries who have just arrived on the field here in the last couple of months. And this is the, the Miller family, Matt and Kaylin Miller, to Serbia. And uh, just to summarize a couple of prayer requests before I read a few things, uh, pray for their Serbian visa finalization. Uh, pray for Kaylin's health. There's more of that in the letter I'll read. Uh, Serbian disciples' uh, new baby. And that's also in the letter. You'll hear about that. Uh, Serbian home search. Answered prayers. We have a car. Uh, found language teachers. Had a great Serbia trip. And they were able to sell our truck. So if you remember, uh, the Millers are from Oklahoma. A farmer, and God called him to the, uh, the mission field and came through our church on deputation. We started supporting him, that family, uh, as they left our church. So praise the Lord for that. And I'll be honest, there are a few things that just kind of got don't make sense in this letter, like a couple of sentences that were left off, but uh, we're going to do our best because I want you praying for this family. So first off, trip to Serbia. The twin prop plane touched down first thing in the morning as the sun began to rise. My first solo reconnaissance trip had officially begun. A Serbian border uh, code name Lou, a Serbian brother code name Lou, is planning on picking me up at, at the rental car store in a few minutes. This will be the first time I have met him since we began our talks and fellowship a, four, a, few, a few short years ago. He is a godly man who loves the Lord and looks forward to many uh, God and Bible-centered Baptist churches being born in Serbia. We met, and it was like we have been brothers for ages. It's amazing what the bond of Christ will do, even around the world. Brother Lou showed me around the city, stopping for coffee often as we discussed the future. Our excitement matched each other's, each other's as we dreamed about what God is doing and prepping in Serbia. Brother Lou had set up some meetings for us to visit other Christians who love the Lord. The meetings were above my expectations, and the fellowship of those families was richly encouraging. With much prayer and counsel, we began plans for returning every month for a week or so as we meet with people and begin discipleship. Brother Lou has agreed to help, me, help teach me the Serbian ways and the language as well as translating. Uh, praise God for leading us to Brother Lou for help, encouragement, and even a man of God that I can look up to as well. Please keep him and your families uh, him and his family in your prayers. Uh, for an automobile, as many of you have seen in the pictures that we provide, we have been using the Croatia church's van. They've been in Croatia trying to get a visa to get into Serbia, and so that's why they're making these trips from Croatia into Serbia. It says, with a lack of a visa, getting our own vehicle has been a struggle. However, we finally found a station wagon that we were able to purchase, and it works great for our needs. The car was owned by a missionary and man of God in Italy. The car would not pass Italy's emissions, so he was willing to sell it to us for $2,500, which is unbelievable. Uh, it was also a willing, uh, it also uh, took a bus five hours uh, to Italy to pick up our new car. Uh, she is a diesel and a beast. We look forward to getting many years of use out of her. I now have bestowed her the Serbian girl name of, and it's in Serbia, uh, Dragana means dear or lovely. New family edition. I would like to give you a preview of what's coming in the January 2023 prayer letter that will include a brand new Miller. Lord willing and everything goes well, yes, we're expecting a new baby. And now many of you know the struggles that Kaylin endures with carrying a child. So far she's been okay. Uh, no hospital trips yet and no complications. However, typically they do come. So please pray that God gives us an easy journey with this baby. Nonetheless, God be glorified. And then finally, change of plans. As you know, the plans have been uh, to intern in Croatia for a year and then move to Serbia. We're going to stay, we we're going to stay north for six months and then southern Croatia for six months and then move to Serbia. However, with all the new situations that we've been given, it is agreed by all for us to move to Serbia. We are currently, we currently live here in Novi Sade, Serbia. So it sounds like 
they've already moved. That's one of the things that just sounded confusing to me. We'll be renting a house for a few years until we can save uh, to buy a house for our own. Life is moving so fast, and we praise God for his leading. Thanks for prayer. So I don't know if that means the visa situation got worked out or they got a temporary tourist visa to get into Serbia, but it sounds like they moved into this into the country that God has called them to minister to. And uh, as you saw, some of the other prayer requests are heard from the letter, a uh, number of things that we can pray for and lift up this young family serving on the mission field now. So if you're able, let's stand. We'll open in prayer, and then Larry will come and lead us in some hymns of the faith. Father, we're thankful for the Miller family. We're thankful that you have called them and that they responded to that call and left all here in the States to go and minister uh, your word in this foreign land. And Father, we were moved by the, the burden that, uh, that uh, Brother Matt had when he, when he shared that here and preached for us, and we're thrilled to be part of their ministry support team. So Lord, continue to go before them. It's apparent that you've done that in many ways already. Continue to, uh, to smooth the path for them as they uh, finalize exactly where they'll be living long-term, where to start their first church. Thank you for providing other believers that can be the foundation of those churches that uh, have been such an encouragement to this young family. We pray for Kaylin's health. Lord, as she is carrying this new child, that that would go smoothly. And uh, Lord, even if there are difficulties, you would use those as a way to uh, uh, draw attention to, to your name, to help folks to see the, the faith and the trust and the hope that they have in Christ. And uh, Lord, uh, many times it's a new baby that can break the ice in difficult areas where uh, th those who don't know you as Savior can get excited about seeing a, a new baby and just pave the way for many opportunities for them to share the truth of the gospel. So, Lord, however you plan to do it, we, we entrust that all to you and pray that you would bless this family, meet their needs, keep them healthy and safe, give them boldness as they share forth with the truth, and may the name of Christ be glorified as churches are established in this very needy area. Father, we love you. We ask your blessing on the remainder of the service this evening. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Brother Larry. Start our service by saying, I think I've dropped that about 50 times in a year. Start our service by saying in 389, I will sing the wondrous story. <clears throat>
Jesus Christ, who died for me, sing it with the saints in glory, gathered by the crystal sea. The song says moment by moment, every moment, every moment, every moment, right? We need to be thinking of our testimony and praising God. Moment, every moment. I know I fail a lot of times, but every moment. <clears throat> Dying with Jesus, my death reckoned by, living with Jesus, a new life divine, looking to There's something about that name. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. You want to do that one too? Yeah. All right. I'm sorry. Forgive me. <laughs> something about that name. <clears throat> Fragrance after 
Well, I hope you received one of these quotes, a card with a quote on it, as you came in. If anybody did not get one of these, uh, there are some up here. Would you slip your hand up, and I'll send Eric running if you don't have one. Anybody, anybody? Parker <laughs> up here says he wants one. Um, maybe he can share for a minute. All right. Miss, Miss Chris up here needs one. Thank you guys so much. I'd like to read this along with you. This is a great, great quote on our Baptist heritage by Charles Spurgeon, who was a Baptist, and of course of a a previous century, uh, back in the 1800s, but it says this, we believe that the Baptists are the original Christians. We did not commence our existence at the Reformation. We were reformers before Luther or Calvin were born. We never came from the Church of Rome, for we were never in it. But we have an unbroken line up to the apostles themselves. We have always existed from the very days of Christ, and our principles, sometimes veiled and forgotten, like a river which may travel underground for a little season, have always had honest and holy adherence. Persecuted alike by Romanists and Protestants of almost every sect, yet there has never existed a government holding Baptist principles which persecuted others, nor, I believe, any body of Baptists ever held it to be right to put the consciences of other under the control of man." We have ever been ready to suffer, as our martyrologies will prove, but we are not ready to accept any help from the state to prostitute the purity of the bride of Christ to any alliance with the government, and we will never make the church, although the queen, the despot, over the consciences of men. We're going through our series on the Baptist distinctives. Could I have the Baptist distinctive slide up there with all the different... And these are the things, if you wanted to know what's the difference between Baptists and Catholics, what's the difference between Baptists and Pentecostals, what's the difference between Baptists and Methodists, um, or Baptists and Mormons, or any other sort of uh, denomination or cult that would claim themselves to be Christian, or one way or another, these are the things that we are distinctive, that we are known for as Baptist people, and we believe that these things came out of the Bible. The Bible made me a Christian, and the Bible made me a Baptist, meaning that the things I found in the Bible led me to faith in Jesus Christ as my Savior, and the things I found in the Bible led me to take the position of Baptist. Uh, I'm not a Baptist because my parents were Baptist. Uh, I'm Baptist because when I look at the Scriptures, I find that the people that are doing church and worship and faith, most like the people of the New Testament are the Baptist people. If there was somebody else doing it more closely to the way that Jesus and his disciples did it, I'd go be one of them. So it's not about adherence to Baptists for Baptist's sake. It's because of the biblical nature of it. And so we've gone over a number of these Baptist distinctives, and if you look closely, you'll see that they all start with a letter that's been highlighted and underlined, and it spells out what? Baptists. This is... This is not scripture. This is just something that somebody came up with. It's not new to me, but it's a way to help you remember the Baptist distinctive. So we talked about the Bible as our final authority on faith and practice. So when we want to know what's right and wrong, what's true and false, what ought to be done or ought not to be done, especially in the domain of God and the things of God, we look to the Bible. The autonomy of the local church means that every church is an independent congregation. And no one rules over that church except for Jesus Christ himself. The priesthood of the believer means that you have direct access to God through the Lord Jesus Christ. He is now our high priest. He's made us all priests and kings. And he says we can come boldly before the throne of grace now because of the access that Christ has given to us. That hasn't always been the case. In the Old Testament, you couldn't just go straight to God in the way that you and I can. Two offices talking about the pastor, the role of the pastor, and the role of the deacon. And we spoke about those things last time. And that brings us to individual soul liberty today. Individual soul liberty. So how much should we exert control over other people's beliefs? How much should we exert control over other people's beliefs? Do we want people to believe in Christ? Absolutely. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance, right? God who wants all men to be saved, the Bible says. But can we make people believe? No, we can't make people believe. As much as we know it would be the best thing for them to have the forgiveness of sins and eternal life, we can't make anyone believe anything. We want people to live holy lives, 
But is it right to pass laws or to coerce and force people to live a certain way, even if it's according to the Bible? And the answer is, we have to be very careful with that. How many of you think people ought to go to church? How many of you think people ought to be arrested if they don't go to church? Right? So hopefully, other than the two children in here who, who we need to watch out for, they may become third world despots ruling over some Latin American country. Uh, I hope they don't. But we don't want to do that. In fact, our forefathers were imprisoned as Baptists because they refused to be a part of the Church of England. They refused to go to their services, and it was a crime. If you were 16 years and older, you had to be there in attendance or else you would get in trouble. And you couldn't have your own private church meetings, and you couldn't preach unless you were given a license by the Church of England. Uh, and there's much more that could be said about the history of it. So we, we have this, this situation where we want people to believe, we want people to act a certain way, but we have to be very careful about not controlling the consciences of men or acting in such a way that the Lord doesn't act and forcing people to do or to believe certain things. So is it okay to just have, let people believe anything they want to believe? That, that's what we're going to look at today. So if you have your Bibles handy, we're going to be in Romans 14. We're going to be in lots of places tonight, but we are looking at the concept of soul, of individual soul liberty, sometimes called uh, soul competency, depending on which book you may have read. So Romans 14 in verse number 10 says this. Romans 14 in verse number 10 says this. But why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. Verse 12. So then, every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Let us not therefore judge one another any more, but judge this rather, that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. Let's pray together. Father, I pray that you'd give us wisdom and understanding. I pray that you'd open the scriptures to us. I pray you, you give me clarity of thought and speech and your spirit's working in all of us. In Jesus' name, amen. The Apostle Paul was a missionary church planner. He traveled from city to city, teaching people about Jesus and seeing them baptized and organized into local churches. And then he would continue to move on. And oftentimes he would write letters to churches that were having trouble. And apparently it had reached him that the church in Rome was having some issues with something. And I want you to think that the church in Jerusalem was mainly Jewish people that had come to faith in Jesus Christ. That makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? Because it's Jerusalem, and mainly who lives there is Jewish people. But as you got further and further away, starting in Antioch, you had a mixture of Jewish believers in Jesus and Gentile believers, right? The Gentile believer was anybody that was not Jewish. And so normally they're referred to as Greeks because that was like the modern day culture and the way that people thought. Greeks are Romans. The Romans had the government. The Greeks still had the culture. And so you had them in the same church together. And there were certain things that bothered one group that didn't bother the other group. And in Romans chapter 14, Paul addresses what happens inside of a church when you have things like that. And Rome was even more mixed because, of course, the vast majority of people that would be in Rome are going to be Gentile Christians. So what ended up happening was, he said, you've got some, some issues going on where the Jewish people are really upset that the Gentile believers aren't holding to the feast days and to the special festivals, and uh, they're, they're not doing that. And, and the Gentiles were really upset that the Jewish people were eating meat that they bought in the marketplace because a lot of times that meat was offered at a, an altar somewhere to some Greek or Roman god, and then when it was done, they took it to the market and you went and bought it. And so you had some people that were really upset, and the Jewish people were like, we're really upset that you're not honoring these days. And the Gentiles were like, you can't eat that. That was offered to idols. And they say, those aren't gods. They're not anything. If anything, they're, they're demons, and they, they don't have power. We can, we can eat this. And so Paul's plea to this group was, Gentiles, you be respectful and don't put a stumbling block in front of those believers that want to acknowledge those days. And, and Jewish believers, you be very careful before you put a stumbling block or cause trouble for your brother because you eat that meat in front of him. And that reminds him of his days when he used to worship those false gods and he doesn't want to be pulled back into that. That is the beginning part of this chapter. And now we get to this place where it's talking about why are you judging? Why are you condemning your brother? 
And we have this phrase in verse number 12 that says that every man, right? We shall all, so then every one of us, shall give account of himself to God. And that brings us to this place where we have a relationship directly with God if we know Christ is our Savior. And all of us will give an answer for the things that we choose to do. Now, that is a very important word, choose. Would you go back with me to Genesis chapter 1? To Genesis chapter 1? Can you and I really make choices? Now, that sounds like a dumb question, but depending on the kind of church perhaps you've been exposed to or the kind of teachings you've been exposed to, you may end up having questions about whether or not you can make choices, whether you can choose to believe on the Lord or not believe on the Lord, or whether everything, because God knows everything, is already decided and you're just walking like a robot down the programming that has been left for you. But I want us to look at a few things. It says in Genesis chapter 1 and verse number 26, And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. When mankind was created, we were created in the image of God. Now, does that mean that God has a body that looks just like us? Well, God is a spirit, and so he has no need for a body. The things about us that mirror God, that are in his likeness, are those intangible things. The fact that he made us a living soul, which means that we will last as long as God lasts. There's an eternal part of us that is separate from this body, especially once we die. We're creative like God is creative. We understand morality like God understands morality. And we can make choices like God makes choices. And so that is something not just inherent in humans. This is something that God actually gives mankind where we can make choices and there are consequences for those choices. And it's hard for us to understand how God can be sovereign and we can still make choices. And if you ever wonder about how that works out, God has his perfect plan and yet we can make choices. And what if our choices don't align with God's plan? Is God's plan not going to get done? Is God's plan not going to get done? And God is in control of everything. That's what it means for him to be sovereign. And his sovereignty takes into consideration our choices and still works everything out infallibly. You say, how? And I will respond to you, I don't know. I don't know. We find two truths in the word of God, and we'll look into this, is you have that God is sovereign, that he is in control, and man can respond genuinely to God. Man has the ability to choose, and God is completely sovereign. In the Bible, we don't find the middle ground. We say yes to both things. We say yes to the sovereignty of God and yes to the responsibility, the ability to respond. We say yes to the responsibility of mankind. So there is actually a freedom to choose. Now, if, we're not, if, if we go down the idea that God knows everything, so we have no free will, we have no choice, then who's the only person that has any choices? God, right? If none of us have any choices and we're just like dominoes. Any of you ever played with dominoes as a kid? Not the actual game. No one plays the actual game. I'm talking about the fun way to play with dominoes where you line them all up and you push them and they fall and then the next one falls and the next one falls and you know the way that you're really supposed to use dominoes. Some people would say that God was just the one that tapped the beginning and they all started falling down and now we're just falling over when it's our turn to get hit. The problem with that is, we have, if we have no choice, God's the only one that can choose. Where does sin come from? If God is the only one that can choose, then God has chosen for sin to exist. And that makes God the author of sin, which means he's not holy, which is blasphemy. And so people that try and, and pin things down and say that, well, we really don't have any choice and everything's already predetermined and predecided. They, they go a step too far in trying to understand what hasn't been explained to us. The other side of it is people go a little bit too short and they'll say things like, well, maybe God doesn't totally know what's going to happen until after we make the choices, right? That makes him less than God, doesn't it? That makes him less than all-knowing. So it's fine for you and I to look at God, who is so much greater than us, and say that there are things about him we do not understand, but we do understand what he said in his word. 
And the important takeaway from this is we can make decisions. But in verse number 12, like we looked at before in Romans 14, we will give an account, a balance book. Any, any of you still keep a checkbook? How many of you still keep a checkbook? Right? That used to be a thing. People kept checkbooks. Nowadays, everyone just checks everything online and they don't... I mean, how many of you, you can't think of the last time you wrote a check? Right? It's been a minute since you wrote a check. Parker hasn't written a check in forever. He had his hand up there. Right? So, when you think about uh, a balance in a ledger book, you know, in and out and in and out, your assets and your liabilities, that kind of gives you a picture of what we're going to do. We're going to give an account to Christ. Those of us that know Christ as our Savior, we're going to stand before him, not in judgment over heaven and hell, but over whether or not we were faithful with the things that he put into our hands. And so we are going to give an answer. And so we do get to make choices, but we also have consequences for those choices. So I want you to think of a few of the major choices in the Bible so that we know that choices are real. We were just in Genesis 1, but would you look in Genesis 2? In Genesis 2, the reality of choices... In Genesis 2, in verse number 16. Genesis 2, in verse number 16. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. So here's God in paradise, in Eden, right? Setting forth... The one rule that Adam and Eve had, you are not allowed to eat that. Now, if God was telling them, you're not going to because I, I will for you not to, then, then it's sort of hard to explain in chapter 3, in verse number 6, it says, And the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise. And she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. So here, they're told, you've got a legitimate choice to make, and there's consequences for that choice. And the choice was whether or not you will obey God or you will disobey God. Whether or not you will eat of the tree or that you will obey the Lord and abstain from it. And so even though they were told not to, they had a legitimate choice, and they made that choice, and they chose to do it, and there were consequences because of that. And Joshua, we looked at this not too long ago, talking about purposing for our families. In Joshua 24, in Joshua 24, you may say, why am I going to such great lengths here? Some of you are, are even, you are happily unaware of Reformed theology and some of the difficulties that go on with people and uh, what you might call um, double predestinarianism and things like that. And I'm glad that you are unaware of it and you are perfectly happy. But for those that may have been infected by it because it is the theology of the moment, I want you to see that mankind really is offered a choice. So in Joshua chapter 24, in verse number 14, it says, Now therefore fear the Lord. Joshua 24 and verse 14. Now therefore fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in truth. And put away the gods which your father served on the other side of the flood and in Egypt. And serve ye the Lord. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom ye will serve. Notice that phrase, choose you this day whom ye will serve. Whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So here, Joshua, at the end of his life, is standing before the children of Israel. They've left Egypt. They've gone through the wilderness wanderings. They've made it into the promised land. God gave them the promised land. And now jo uh, Joshua's at the very end of his life, and he's looking around, seeing a bunch of undecided, mixed people that are partially serving God and partially worshiping the gods of Egypt. And he challenges them, and he says, Choose this day. You need to make a choice. You've got to stop having one foot over here and one foot over here. You need to make a choice on which side you're going to be on. And he says, you need to serve the Lord. But if it seems evil, if it seems like the bad choice to serve the Lord, you need to make a choice. You need to choose. What an unusual thing for someone to challenge someone to do if there's no ability to make a choice. And then I think perhaps something that you and I are more familiar with in modern times, we might find in Romans 10. In Romans 10, in verse number 13. In Romans 10, in verse number 13, the choice that I hope all of you have made this evening 
is that choice of putting your faith and trust in Christ as your Savior. It says in Romans 10 and verse number 13, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. This statement here is an open invitation as Christ commanded us to preach the gospel to every creature, to go into all the earth, all the earth even unto the uttermost. It's an open invitation of the gospel. People make a decision. They choose whether or not they will respond to the drawing of God's spirit. Some people do choose to respond and some people choose not to respond. There are those that would disagree with us and I'm surprised that they would, they would call themselves Baptists because of this hallmark of the idea of us being able to choose. But there are some people that are Reformed, they would call themselves, and they're Baptists. And they would say, no, there is no choice. If God decides you're one of the elect, too bad, you're going to heaven. And if you're not one of the elect and you want to get in, you don't get in. Or they'll say, you don't have any desire to go in, so you don't even ask to go in. That, unfortunately, again, puts the choice of God arbitrarily choosing some people to go to heaven and some people to go to hell, which I think is blasphemous against the character of God who already said he desires for all men to be saved. And so if he has the wherewithal to override man's ability to decide and to make people get saved, make everybody get saved if there's no choice involved, if that's what God's will is. So kind of, kind of confusing if, if you want to, you can just erase the last three minutes from your memory unless you're one of the people that have been thinking on something along those lines. And then I hope that's a blessing to you. But there's the reality of consequences. There's the reality of consequences. We make legitimate choices and we experience consequences, right? Uh, we have a society that wants not just the freedom to make choices, but they want the freedom to choose their consequences. Right? They don't just want the freedom to choose, they want the freedom to choose their consequences. Somebody might tell you, well, um, I don't believe. I don't believe that there's a God. Okay, you can choose to believe that if you want to, but there's consequences. They might say, I don't, I don't believe that, that there's only one way to God. Well, you can choose to believe that, but there's consequences. Right? We don't go around forcing people to believe anything, as, especially as Baptist people. We have been on the receiving end of that, where people said, no, if you don't line up with what the Roman Catholic Church teaches, you're going to be imprisoned or executed, and our forefathers were. And even the places where there were state-run churches in Protestant nations, Church of England, Germany, places like that, they would take our forefathers that did not line up with their doctrine, and they would persecute and imprison and sometimes kill even them. And so they were trying to get people to believe and force them to act a certain way and control the consciences of men. We would not do that. Does Christ do that? Does he force us to believe? Does he for No, but are there consequences? Yes. The way of the transgressor is hard, right? The way of the transgressor is hard. You can choose to ignore God. You can choose to ignore his word. You can choose to, to believe something else. But by that choice, you're going to have the consequences of that choice. It says, for those of us that are believers, in Romans 14, in Romans chapter 14, in verse 10, at the very end of that, that verse, it says, for we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. We shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. So we will give an account, as we said before, and we're to give an account to Jesus. So if I chose to believe false doctrine because it was easier for me to do it, if I chose to do wrong things and cover it up and rationalize it, I'm going to have to answer to that one day when I stand before the Lord. Not in whether or not I'm going to heaven, but in whether or not I get the rewards that I desire to get. Whether or not I can cash in, as it were, on my investments in eternity. Look in Galatians 6, would you? In Galatians 6. Again, the idea of making choices and there being consequences. Galatians 6 and verse number 7. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. 
two paths of living two ways of living either doing the thing that the flesh wants or doing the thing that the spirit wants either giving into the desires of the fleshly part of us that though we're saved now and we have the spirit of christ living inside of us there's still that old flesh that wants to do wrong and it's like gravity kind of always pulling on us and we have to be aware of it we can either feed that and make that choice and then we reap corruption right you plant those seeds you reap that harvest or we can plant and we can sow to the spirit and we can reap treasures in heaven and the eternal life lived out in us even now so there are legitimate choices here there's consequences in this life as we see but also in the life to come in john 3 in john chapter 3 in verse number 18 in john chapter 3 in verse number 18 he that believeth on him is not condemned but he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten son of god he's saying you've got two different people that have made two different choices those that have believed and those that have not believed and the ones that have believed is not condemned he's not judged guilty but the one that believes not who is not trusted in christ is already condemned there's this there's this idea that when you get to the end of your life all of your good deeds and all of your bad deeds are going to be measured against each other at the end of your life and hopefully your good will there's nothing about that in the bible and it's even worse than that for the person that doesn't know christ you're not waiting till the end of your life to see whether or not you're condemned it says you're condemned already you're already found guilty the only thing that needs to happen to a person that doesn't know christ for them to end up in hell forever is for them to stop breathing that's all there is to it and that ought to be a sobering thought for those that don't know christ it ought to be a motivating thought for those that do know christ to get the gospel out to people and so there's consequences in the world to come for the choices that we make but also not just for the unsaved but for the christian look in first corinthians if you would please first corinthians three In verse number 12. Now, if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day it shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work what sort it is. If any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon he shall receive a reward if any man's work shall be burned he shall suffer loss but he himself shall be saved yet so as by fire so there's this idea that if we have worthy treasures worthy actions worthy motivations that we bring up before the lord and it's tested and it survives the trial of it then those things remain and the rewards but if we if we put the wrong things you know there's a difference if you take a ruby and put it through a fire right what happens it's fine on the other side you put stubble wood hay through fire what ends up happening well it'll it'll burn up it won't be there anymore it consumed right it's consumed so there's consequences of it and so on a practical matter though we're talking about individual soul liberty and and let's say let's say that for example sean sean and i disagree about something right sean and i disagree about something i can share the scriptures with him i can show him why i believe what i believe but at the end of the day can i make him agree with me no i can't i can't make sean i can't I, there's no way for me to do that i might be able to threaten him to act a certain way but i can't make him believe any different but sean will have to give an account of himself to the lord and i'll have to give an account of myself to the lord and so that is the idea behind individual soul liberty that you can know god you can know his word and you can make choices that have legitimate value in them you can make choices that have legitimate value we're warned against constantly judging our brethren in romans 14 in romans 14 in verse 10 it says but why dost thou judge thy brother or why dost thou set it not thy brother 
Why, why are you, remember the context here is these Roman Christians and some of them are Gentiles and some of them are Jews and, and there's non-essential type things that are sinking some of their ships or causing it to be a stumbling block and there's problems, right? There's problems inside of here. Um, you know, there's, let's, let's think of something where we can get in trouble and make it to something modern day because the idea of celebrating feasts or, or meat offered to idols, uh, maybe, maybe that's... Um, Okay, this is an old-timey one. This is an old-timey one. Are you ready? Shopping on Sunday. Shopping on Sunday. It was not uncommon 50, 60 years ago to find that good, godly, church-going people, you'd find people say, you don't shop on Sunday. That's the Lord's Day. The only thing you're doing is you're going to the Lord's house and you're going back to your house. Right? That's it. Maybe you'll see family. But that's all that you're doing. You're not allowed. I, I went to a, a Bible college, not, not at Crown. I went to a different one um, for a summer program. And they had changed the rule a little bit. But the rule used to be, even for their adult students, you can't go shopping on Sunday. But they changed it up. And you can do light grocery shopping if you have to run out and pick something up. And you say, that seems kind of silly. But at one time, it was a really big divisive issue. So imagine if Sean thought it was OK to shop on Sunday. And I said, nah. uh you are profaning the Lord's day. You should have taken care of that yesterday. Now, how I treat him, how I treat him, says a lot about my character. He's saying, why are you judging him for that? Why are you condemning him? Why are you setting him at naught? To set something at naught means to look at someone and to decide, or something, and to decide it has no value. It's worthless. You've, you've had someone look at you like that before. They're like, ugh. You know, I wear, I wear an awful lot of suits, and, and, but this one time I went to a suit store to pick up a suit, and I was in, like, outdoor work clothes. And I walked into this nice, clean store, and I was in my outdoor work clothes, and I had a Carhartt jacket on, and it was winter time, and I walked in there, and this guy in a three-piece suit who looked all sharp, he kind of looked at me, he's like, Ugh. Ugh. You ever had that experience? I don't know if you had that experience. And then, and you're like, wait a minute, <laughs> I'm coming here to pick up something I bought. That's what it means to set your brother at naught. So I'm sitting here like, can you believe Sean? He shops on Sunday. He shops on Sunday. I think that's terrible. I think he doesn't love Jesus. Right? Now, okay, a bit silly because of what it is, but I'm setting him at naught and I'm judging him. Who does he have to answer to? Me? Is it my job to straighten him out after I've shared the word of God with him and he disagrees on it? That's up to him and the Lord. He's going to have to answer to that. I'm going to have to answer for it. It also, not just in that part, but in verse number 13. Let us not therefore judge one another anymore. Don't condemn one another anymore. We're done with that. This is about among brethren, among believers. But judge this rather, that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. Meaning that um, I'm not trying to ruin his walk with God by something that I might be doing that offends him, and he will be careful not to do that. So Paul said, listen, if you guys, you Gentiles, are upset that I'm eating meat because it may have been offered to idols and that's bothering you, then he said, as long as the world stands, I won't eat any meat in front of you. In front of you. Right? Right? He's like, I'm not going to do something that's going to... Is that a problem for you? Then I'm not doing it. Why? Because the rule of interaction among brethren should always be grace. It should always be graciousness. It should always be deference. It should always be the other person going first. He talks about... Uh, the Lord talks about his mutual submission, which is something we've touched on in other sermons. So what are some points of application here? So we know we can make choices. We know that they have consequences. And we know that we'll all answer for the Lord, to the Lord. So it's not my job to control what you believe. You say, you're the pastor. Yep. And if you notice, everything I try and, and tell you that you ought to do, I try and take you to the Bible and show you where it says it. Anybody ever notice that I try and do that? Right? I, I think every preacher ought to do that. Because it's not about what I have to say. It's about what the Word of God has to say. Because, I, I mean... I've been wrong many times just today. If you want examples, ask my wife. I'm, I'm sure that they're there. I'm sure that they're there. So first thing, take responsibility for your actions. Take responsibility for your actions. Many people will blame others or situations for their bad choices. 
And we live in a society that celebrates victimhood. Which means you're a, you're a poor victim and there's nothing you can do about your circumstances and you are not, you're not responsible for the things that you've done. You're not responsible, perhaps, for the things that happened to you, but for how you react to the situations that are presented to you. You and I are responsible. You and I are responsible. We may not have made the choices, and other people's sinful choices may have impacted us, but I want you to know, if another person's sinful choices have impacted you, that has already gone through the sovereign knowledge of God and his protective hand, and he's allowed it. It may have started out as someone's sinful habit, but the, by the time it hits you, it's become God's will for you in that moment to deal with that situation. And that's hard to grasp, but it's an important truth. And we, we are responsible for how... So some people have an easier time than others because of how they were born and some things come up. I don't know why some people are called to suffer. You know who I'm talking about, right? People that chronically are ill, maybe ill for most of their lives, and other people... They don't have that kind of health issue, or at least they don't for that season. We don't know why everyone has the situations in life that they have, but all of us are responsible for responding to those situations in a Christ-honoring, God-empowered way of dealing with it. You see, we've all, we've all sinned, and we need to own that. If you don't know Christ as Savior, part of knowing Christ is recognizing that you are a sinner, right? That you have lied, you have stolen, you have hated, you have lusted, Right? You have worshipped things other than God. You have dishonored your parents at some point. Recognizing that, owning that, realizing we can't do anything about it and that we need a Savior. And that's why the Lord Jesus Christ came to this earth, lived a sinless life. God became a man without ceasing to be God, lived a sinless life, fulfilled the requirements that you and I could never fulfill, and he laid his life down as a sacrifice to pay for you and I so we might have a way back to God and our sins might be forgiven. So by taking responsibility for our actions, it's actually one of the most important things that we can do in getting saved. It's also one of the most important things we can do in getting victory in our lives. Do you know Christ has saved us from the penalty of sin? He saved us from the penalty of sin. The penalty of sin is death and hell forever, but he saved us from it. But do you know what else he's in the process of saving us from? The power of sin. One day he'll save us from the presence of it when we're taken into glory. But the, the power. But you know what he doesn't have the power to save us from? Bad habits. Poor choices. I've got a, a little problem. No, he gives us power to overcome sin. And until we recognize what it is as sin, we don't go to the Lord with it like we ought to. I don't have uh, a bad temper. I am an angry man. I am wrathful, according to the Bible, right? I don't have trouble keeping my, my mind clean. I am dealing with lust in my own heart. You see, by owning what it is and naming what it is, then you can bring this thing to Christ and say, this is what I'm battling. Help me. Um, have you, ever, have you ever encouraged someone to go to the doctor when they didn't want to go? You encourage them to go to the doctor? Anyone ever make an appointment for you? I'm sure you've never had that. I made an appointment for you so you could go. Well, you don't want to find out any bad news, right? So you go in there and you tell the doctor, even though your back is killing you and your feet are hurting and, and you end up having these chest pains and, and it's just every once in a while it's hard to breathe and that, you're like, ah, it's just, it's just, a, it's just a cold. I have a cough, that's all. You're like, wait a minute, there's a lot more going on than what you're saying is going on. And if you don't call it what it is, which could very well be a heart problem, you're not going to deal with it the way it needs to be dealt with. And the same thing is true with our sin if we fail to take responsibility and say, I did it, it was wrong, it was against God, I agree with God that it was wrong, now Christ, please cleanse me from it and give me the power to overcome it. So take responsibility. The second thing is to build influence with others. Let's go back to Sean shopping on Sunday, shall we? Poor Sean. We're just, we're just calling out all of his sins in church. I can't make Sean do anything. My only two avenues to change Sean's heart are prayer and influence. Prayer and influence. You say, what is influence? 
If I have built a relationship with Sean to where he knows that I love him and that he knows that I'm in his corner and I'm there for him and I try and give him good advice and we have fun together and I, I'm, his, I'm his friend, he knows I'm his friend and when I come to him and I'm like, listen, Sean, I really think you ought to leave your shopping to other days. I really think you ought to give the Lord's Day entirely to God. I think that you're, you're allowing things to get, and I don't think you're going to like where it ends up. If I've built up the right kind of relationship with him, he's much more likely to be open to what I have to say. If I've prayed, the Spirit of God will pull him in the right direction he ought to go to. But if all I ever do is tell Sean what's wrong with him, why in the world would he care what I have to say? Why in the world would he care what I have to say? If all I've ever done is pick at him and complain and ignore him, and the only time I ever talk to him is to point out what's wrong, I have no influence with him. I have no influence with him because I've never even showed him I cared. And I'm not talking about influence to manipulate him. I'm talking about influence because he knows that I legitimately care about him. And really, that's all we got at the end of the day. You've got your kids for a little while under your authority, but as Pastor Steve has said, and we've talked about before, the day comes when they're not under your authority anymore. And if you haven't built up some influence, you don't have anything with your kids. They're going to run from you as fast and far as they can. If they don't know you love them, if you haven't spent the time investing in them. God wants people to live holy lives. He wants people to believe in him. But since we can't make them, we have to pray and build influence. So demonstrate your love in action. Be the best family member. Be the best friend or employee or student. Encourage those around you. Be there when people need you. The last thing is to allow God to change people's hearts. To allow God to change people's hearts. If you notice an error in somebody's life and it's appropriate for you to speak with them about it, you have the kind of relationship, right? You have the kind of relationship. You know, I, I use this illustration for a second uh, when, I, when I was teaching people about building relationships to share the gospel when I was down in Tennessee. Pastor Steve, would you stand up for a moment, please, and help me? Now, this is going to get weird. Are you ready? Okay. How are your kidneys doing? Yeah, good as far as I know. Is that a little weird? How many of you think that's a little weird, right? Now, I'm just some random guy who walked up and asked him how his kidney... What if I was his doctor? wouldn't be weird anymore. Why? Because I had the right relationship. I had the right relationship. Okay, thank you very much for letting me check your kidneys. I think you're fine, as far as I know. If I have the right relationship, I can speak with him. Oftentimes, unless you're someone's parent, or you're their pastor, or you have a very close friendship, you ought to be very careful about how you approach them about things going on, because uh, un, what is it? unsought advice is rarely heeded and often scorned. Is that how the old phrase goes? Meaning that if you didn't ask for their opinion, you don't want it. But if you're their pastor or their parent or you're a very close friend, maybe you feel that you can come and speak with them about something. And so you bring them to God's word and you show them why you really think that they're, they're in trouble. Let's say, for example, that I have a friend who's a believer and, um, and uh, he, wants to, he wants to move in with his girlfriend and they're not married. As, as his pastor, if he's a member of my church or something like that, I'm going to sit down and I'm going to talk to him and say, listen, you don't want to do that. I love you. I want the best for you. I'm telling you right now, you want to do it God's way. You want to have God's blessing. You don't want to ruin this. Even the world understands statistically that if you live together first before you get married, you're much more likely to get divorced. Look up statistics on cohabitation sometime and divorce. It's depressing. Divorce is bad enough as it is, let alone to add in all of those things. So you really don't want to do it. You're going to end up in situations where you ought not be. And, and they might say, I understand what you're saying, Pastor, but my situation is da-da-da-da-da-da. I need to, you know, for the sake of rent or whatever, or we're about to get married, or we really love each, whatever their reasons are. And you reason with someone from the scriptures, and they refuse to do what's right. After a while, all you can do is give them over to the Lord and to pray that God changes their heart. And the wonderful news is he does. He does change their heart. Now, 
granted, that specific situation, because I'm the pastor and if they're a member of this church and they're living openly in sin, that's a little different. We might get into a church discipline type situation. But let's just imagine that you're friends and you're warning somebody saying, I don't think you want to go down that road. I've seen where that leads. And they refuse to listen to you. All we have is influence in prayer. All we have is influence in prayer. You can't make them stop. But you can sure allow God to do it and to leave it there. This, this is probably the most grievous in your children or in your grandchildren. Don't you wish you could just control your kids and make them do stuff? Like even, even now when my kids are young, I can make them go to stuff, but I can't make them love the things of God. I can't make them love good music. I can't make them love uh, good media to watch. I can't make them love to be around the right people. I can only try my best. At some point, at some point, I have to realize that it's in God's hands and not really in my hands because everyone has their own choices to make. That's one of the beautiful things and one of the kind of scary things about individual soul liberty is that people are going to get their own ability to decide and we have in a scary way, less control over the things that are the most important to us than we all realize. So we have to hand these things over to God. We have to pray and not scheme. I want my children to believe. I want my grandchildren to believe, but there's only so much that I can do. And so that's why we pray. That's why we're a praying people. So I have a couple of questions. I have a couple of questions. So how many of you like history? Any of you like history? Any of you like church history? Okay, so here's a question for you. What does it look like when people take it upon themselves to force others to believe something? Ron? Inquisition. The Inquisition? Yeah, for those of you that are unfamiliar, that was a really bad time of persecution where anybody thought of, of heresy against the, the Catholic Church was oftentimes tortured as a heretic and, and even put to death. What else does that look like, Ben? Pardon? Being a bully? Yeah. Sean? But it is close. Yes. Yes. Yeah, it's a nice word just for saying controlling. Yeah, it can it can be bad. Shannon? Yep. Islamic countries where if you don't abide by Sharia law or whatever version of, of Sharia law that they follow, you can be imprisoned for it. Absolutely. So you, you can see in it's because we live in the United States, because we're part of Western society, we, we have it in our mind that most of history has been free for people to decide, but it's actually been the other way around. Most of history, there has almost always been a state-run religion that has forced people to follow what they say. And even when there was some toleration going on, like in England when our forefathers eventually left for, for Holland and then came over to the United States, um, the Church of England, though they may have tolerated those, they were still funded by tax dollars. They still enjoyed all the, the protection and the buildings and things like that of the government. So there, there have been times when the state church was the norm. In fact, most of history, it's sadly been like that. How, give me some examples of how to build influence with people. I'm not talking about manipulation, remember. I'm talking about genuine relationships so that you can be a blessing. Sean? Show them love. How, how do we show them love? That's absolutely right. How do we do it? I mean, be self-sacrificial. If they need something, you know. If they need something. You know, give them, do it Yeah. Okay, so it's, it's a self-sacrificial mow their grass. You can come mow my grass. That's great. Thank you. I appreciate your self-sacrificing love. No, seriously, what does it look like to build influence? How, how do you build influence with somebody? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, okay. Yeah, good. Yeah. When you try and help them, help them from your own life experience and say, listen, I did that and it ended up poorly. You don't want that. Chris? Get to know them, show interest in their life and what's going on, you know, whether good or bad, and like, to show genuine interest in, in their lives. Show genuine interest in their lives, yeah. Shannon? Pray for them when things aren't going wrong. Pray for them even when things aren't going wrong. Yeah, how else do you build influence? Ben? Yeah, maintaining a good testimony. Yeah, if someone's a rotten Christian and then they go and tell you how to, how to be a good Christian, how, how many of you people are listening to that person? Lena? Being polite to them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. Parker? Yeah, being kind. Those, those are all great ideas. How, how do we change someone's heart? Sean? We don't. The Lord has to do it. We don't. The Lord has to do it. You were listening. It was a trick. But what can we do? Pray? Encourage? Yes. You know, if I'm, if I'm being corrected by somebody and, and they've been encouraging me, I'm much more likely to receive it. I'm much more likely to receive it. It's true. And if you know Charles Keene, some of you probably know Charles Keene. One time he had to sit me down and correct me about something. But he had always been for me even up until that moment. And even in that moment he was for me. And I could see, and I didn't like it, but he was right and I was wrong. And he had to sit down and tell me that I'd overstepped a bound somewhere. And, but I knew that he had my best interest at heart. I knew it. And you know what we did? He just spent time with me. He'd say, Bill, I'm going to get my vacuum cleaner fixed. You want to come with me? And so we'd drive in his car to the store to get his vacuum cleaner fixed, and we would talk with each other, and we would just visit. It was, you know, and then he'd want to go here, and you know, I'd go with him, and time together. All of that is very, very helpful. Very helpful. So then, every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Let's pray together. Father, I pray that you would help us to make the choices that honor you, I pray that you'd help us not to despair and to become victims, but to remember that we're overcomers, that we're more than conquerors through Christ. Thank you for the power of the Spirit of God shed abroad in our hearts to love as we ought to, and for the, the spirit of love and a power and of a sound mind that you give us. I pray that you would help us to live and work in that. Help us to build up our brothers and sisters around us in Christ, that we might have influence to help them to grow and to become more like you. I pray that you'd help us to be people of prayer instead of scheming. Give us peace by entrusting these people into your hands. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. How many of you have your large print prayer sheet? We have a large print prayer sheet. Pastor Steve just said they're all getting really old and they need the bigger sheet. He said they're all getting really old. No, no, that didn't happen. We're having trouble with our printer and so this is what came out. So they're, they're fixing it. The good news is they've changed out so many parts, by the time we're done, we're going to have a brand new printer upstairs, so that's a good thing. Two important prayer requests that came in most recently, uh, Carol Haney had a fall and passed out and has been taken to the hospital, and I don't have a whole lot more about that, but Rick asked, I mean, this was just a few hours ago, right? So uh, do you have an update on her? They are going to admit her to the hospital. Okay, so they're admitting Carol. Do you know which one she's at? Richard Jacobs? Okay. Okay, so that's Avon Clinic. All right, pray for Carol, uh, that the Lord would help her. Uh, pray for Charlie, the whole family. That's very concerning, of course. And then Mike Wagner, who has been in and out of the hospital a lot, he, um, he has an MRI on Monday where they're, they're checking out his kidneys and uh, all of that, trying to figure out what the situation is. And so if you would pray that they'd find something because he's experienced so many repeat trips into the hospital and infections and things that God would give him the grace that he needs. We're, we're praying for Randy and Kelly Johnson. 
as our missionaries of the week and with First Bible International and especially their work in India. There's a trip to India coming up uh, here in August and September, so pray as they go to minister there. We're praying for Lois Keller, and I hope you pray for Lois. She's got a lot of pain and, and difficulty, and, and so hold her up in prayer that God would give her grace. The ministry of the week is Harvest Baptist Missions, and we're praying for the Holly Hills Baptist Church. Um, yes? She was dealing with something GI-oriented, but I don't know that they ever got to the bottom of it. And so this is something separate that she's dealing with today. I appreciate you asking. Um, continue to pray for um, Doug Davis, uh, who had a trip to the hospital when he's home, but he's just dealing with a lot of different health issues. Harry Swartz is still getting in back up on his feet. And uh, poor Devin Jarvis um, talked with, with Sherry, and, and it's just such a heartache, hardship there. So if you'd hold them up. There's a family friend uh, of uh, my dad, especially. His uh, co-worker's mom, her name is Janet Estock, has real serious cancer. And if, so if you could pray, that would, that would be wonderful. And then Sherry's stepson, Joseph Ballard Jr., um, is got serious health problems. And so they're, they're trying to figure out what to do. And may God give them wisdom as they try and figure that out. We have a neighbor two houses down. Uh, his name's Dennis, and he's been diagnosed with what kind of cancer? Do we know? Liver cancer. And um, they've given him about four to six months, and he's always been um, a good neighbor, uh, but never really open to things of the gospel. His wife is saved, but uh, pray that the Lord would open doors for us to speak with him and that the Lord would, uh, would save him. Uh, since he has such short time left. Any other prayer requests that we'd like added? Yeah, Chris. Oh, no. How serious was it? Okay. Okay, Marilyn Cohen has COVID. She's on day three. Pray for Marilyn, if you would. Yep, yeah, Sean? Okay. Praying for Paul Sheridan, who has a kidney infection, has been in and out of the hospital, and he's in the hospital right now. So pray for Paul. Yeah, Larry? Is he? We're praying for Vince Goodwin, who apparently is having trouble with his speech. That sounds serious. Pray for Vince. Anybody else have a prayer request? Yeah, Chris? Okay, we're praying. Donna? Donna Eiler. Donna Eiler. This is Chris's sister-in-law, and she had a, I can't say that bone, but knee, knee, leg-ish. I'm not, I'm not qualified to use words like that. Anybody else? Prayer requests? We want to make sure that we hold up one another in prayer. All right, well, let's make sure that we keep this. You may have to fold it in half this week in order to fit it in your Bible, but you can fit it in your Bible, and you can make sure to pray through those things. In fact, it still has in it, on the back pages, how you can have your own prayer time with God every day and the things that you can pray about. If you've ever wondered, how do I sit and pray for 15 minutes? What do I even pray about for that long? Here's a guide that you can use, as well as all of the names in the prayer sheet. All right, we're going to pray for a couple of these things, and then we'll, we'll close everything out. And in prayer. Clark, would you pray for a few of these things and close us out?
Amen. Thank you so much for being in the Lord's house tonight. Have a wonderful evening as you go.